saw a chart recently. of a famous golfer and the, the winnings he had earned over the various years, past ten years or so. And it wasn't a nice smooth line. It didn't gradually rise and rise and rise and rise. It had its ups and downs. It's largely a affair of its body. Its body had its ups and downs. When you think about the fact that the mind is a lot more complex than the body, then it should come as no surprise that when we meditate, there are going to be lots of ups and downs. It's not going to be a smooth progress from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday to Thursday, just up and up and up and up and up all the time. And so you've got to learn how to deal with the downs, which means that you also have to learn how to deal with the ups. Because the problem is when things go up, we tend to get a little complacent. And when you get complacent, that's going to turn you down. And then you get discouraged, and that can get you even further down. Neither of which attitude is really skillful or helpful in the practice. Because you have to know from the very beginning there are going to be downs. There are some days when the mind gets so still and so clear. And the meditation seems so effortless that you think, ah, oh, this must be it. I finally figured it out. And from here on in, it's all going to be smooth sailing. And then you suddenly discover that the boat capsizes, and you seem to be worse off than you were before. You see this especially in two areas, with the practice of getting the mind into stillness, into concentration and in learning how to let go, using your discernment. And in both cases, you've got to learn how to develop a certain stamina, learn how to keep them on an even keel and not be either excited or upset by things going up or going down. But remind yourself, this is normal. This is the way things are always going to be until you reach stream entry. That's when you finally get something that's really solid and really secure. And so when things go down, on the one hand, you have to learn how to give yourself a pep talk to remind yourself, I can do this. And any thought that comes in mind saying, I've had enough of this, I can't take this anymore, you have to ask yourself, okay, are you ready to take another aeon or two of suffering, because if you don't work on the mind now, there's no guarantee that you'll have chances on in the future. Here you've got the opportunity right here, right now, to work on the mind. And even though there may be some setbacks, this par for the course. And it's amazing how much you can find unexpected sources of strength inside. I had a friend in high school who was in, went into ROTC, he told me after his first bout of military training, there had been one day when they'd been told to run X number of miles. And then just as they got to the, the finish line, where they'd run what they'd been told to run, the instructor said, okay, another quarter mile. And some of the guys just dropped down right there. But some of the other ones realized that they could actually do it. And the instructor was teaching an important lesson. If you're out in a battlefield, there's no telling when the battle is going to end and how long you're going to have to be in there. It's not the case at 5 o'clock, the, the bell rings and then you knock off for the night and get the rest you need. Sometimes the battle just goes on and on and on. Or you think everything is finally settled and some new problem shows up, and you've got to work on that one. You've got to learn how to find your sources of strength inside. And it's good practice to realize that they are there.
but one way of making sure that they are there is not to get discouraged and not to block out of your mind the possibility that they could be there. If it becomes impossible to your mind that you can go any further, it's going to really be impossible. Not for any other reason, though. Simply that you've made up your mind that you're going to be able to give only this much. And then when you've given that much, you think, well, that's it. There's nothing left. What's the John Fung used to say? You're still breathing. Okay, there is still something you can do. And then you learn how to give yourself encouragement on the path. This is the Buddha told Rahula, he says, when you find that you have done something skillful, congratulate yourself. Take joy in the fact that you're actually seeing some results in the training. They may not be permanent results, but at least you're seeing that you're headed in the right direction. And there's no problem with reminding yourself, this is good. I'm beginning to get a handle on this. It's like in a day when you say you have an addiction, and there's one night where you really had to struggle with the addiction, and you won out. Well, the next morning you wake up and remind yourself of how glad you are that you won out, and the addiction didn't win out last night, and sort of fix that point in your memory. So the next time you're tempted to give in to the addiction, you remind yourself, remember how good I felt the next morning? And that gives you some added sources of strength to use against the voice in the mind that says, well, you're going to give in anyhow, so you might as well give in now. Or what you really want is pleasure. Well, here's some pleasure for you right now. And you can counter with the fact that you were really happy that you didn't give in that last time. That gives you some more allies. So when you find that your concentration doesn't quite go so well as it has done in the past, give yourself some encouragement. So I was able to make progress in the past, and of course there's going to be setbacks, so that doesn't mean I'm doomed to failure. And just pick up where you left off. Go back to the beginning and try to be very careful, very perceptive, very precise in how you focus on the breath. Don't try to take on too much. And John Lee gives the example of someone who's planting a new orchard. It's not a good idea, he says, to clear all the, all the land you've got and plant all the land you've got with as many trees as you can afford, because it may come about there'll be a drought soon after you plant the trees, and they're all going to die, and then you don't have anything left. He says, take on what you can manage. If you can only manage a quarter acre at a time, okay, to start out with your quarter acre and clear that, just that part of your land. Plant it with some trees, and as the trees grow, they start giving more fruit, and the fruit then, of course, yields seeds, and you can plant those seeds. And you find that bit by bit by bit things will grow, so you're not totally wiped out by any setbacks. So ask yourself, can I stay with this breath? Okay, you got that breath. How about the next breath? Okay, you got that breath. How about the next one? And as for the progress you made in the past, you don't have to focus on that, because after all, you're not here to focus on past or future. You're here to focus on the present. And of course, in the back of your mind, there's going to be this desire that you want to get back to where you were and to get past where you were. But you can't make that the focus of your attention right now. You focus on just the next step, just the next step. Break everything down into manageable bits. And learn how to give yourself pep talks. As I mentioned earlier, you look into the books of Dharma talks from the Great Ajans. And it's not that they explain very much in their Dharma talks. It's mostly encouragement. that the paths and their fruitions are still within reach. And you've got the basic resources you need. You've got a body, you've got a mind. And that's all you really need for the practice. 
and you need determination, that you really do want to put an end to suffering. And you can fuel that determination by reminding yourself of all the sufferings that you've been through, those that you remember. And you also think of the sufferings that the Buddha tells us about, the ones that we can't remember. All the times you've had your head cut off, all the times you've lost a loved one. And then you look to the future. Do you want more of that? And as for the sufferings in the various realms of rebirth, you don't have to worry about hell or anything else. Just look at the animal realm. All the sufferings that we see that the animals have to go through, all the fears they have, and no one to explain anything to them. That's one form of encouragement. The other form of encouragement, of course, is to read stories of people who actually, actually made it. The Tarigata and the Taragata are very good in this. Stories of the, the nuns and the monks who went through an awful lot and had an awful lot of obstacles in their paths, but they were able finally to break through. And many times you look at the obstacles that they're facing and they're a lot greater than the ones we are. So as the Buddha said, this is a point where, no, <coughs> excuse me, actually it was a nun who said, this is a point where conceit can actually come in helpful. They can do it, why can't I? That may be a form of conceit, but it's a useful help on the path. In other words, you make use of anything that gives you energy, anything that gives you strength in generating the desire and in upholding your intent to let go of what's unskillful and develop what's skillful. The same holds true for different thought patterns, different attitudes, different defilements that we know are not skillful, and yet the mind keeps going back. And sometimes you think you've dealt with it, and then you find a few days later it's come back again. Or it may go away for a couple months, and now that's all. It's suddenly back in full force. And you ask yourself, why? I thought I dealt with that before. Why is it coming back? And if the thought comes up, maybe this is something I can never give up. Don't ever give in to that thought. It is possible to give up any kind of unskillful activity. As the Buddha said, if it weren't possible to do that, he wouldn't have taught. Here it is. He's taught. So what this means is that when you dealt with it before, you were able to deal with it on a partial level, but there may be more, more to it. It's like pulling a pulling out a vine. You think you've got the roots pulled out, and you come back a while later, oh, the vine is grown up again. Well, it means you didn't get all the roots. So you dig around a little bit more. Years back we had this very persistent vine down in the southeast corner of the monastery. I had arranged for somebody to go down and dig it out. We thought it had taken care of, and then a few months later I went back and it was, it was spreading all over the place again. I tried somebody else to go down and dig it out. And again, it came back again. Finally, one time we had a group of people coming down from Vancouver. So I said, okay, see if, if you can get the whole root system. And it was huge. It's about the size of a child. But they were able to get everything out. The, the vine never came back. So if you see something coming back, remind yourself, okay, I didn't get everything last time. Let's go back and look at it again. This is where the image of the mind as a committee comes in useful. You're able to take care of some of the committee members, but others are still active. They may have been quiet the last time you went through, but now they're showing that they're still there. It's time to go back and look at it more carefully. 
it's also important to remember that discernment is not just a matter of knowing what's skillful and what's not skillful. It's also a matter of learning how to talk yourself into doing what's skillful and talk yourself into, out of doing what's unskillful. In other words, it's strategic. Sometimes we get a, the sense that the Buddha's wisdom is a bunch of lists and vocabulary lessons. You've got this list of qualities, and you've got that list of hindrances, and somehow you think if you learn all the lists, that's it. But that's not why the Buddha taught the lists. He wants you to use those lists to analyze what's going on and to figure out what to do about what's going on. It's all strategic. He wasn't like the type of philosopher who just wants to contemplate abstract forms in and of themselves. He was much more pragmatic. He was a craftsperson, and the knowledge of a craftsperson is that you take what works so that you can get the effect that you want. As that passage where the Buddha talks about four types of activities in the world, the things you like to do that give good results, the things you don't like to do that give bad results. And those are not hard at all. The difficult ones, the ones that really test your discernment, he says, are the things that skillful things that you don't like to do, and the unskillful things that you like to do. In other words, things that give bad results, but you like to do them, and things that give good results, but for some reason you don't like to do them. That's where you really learn how to measure your discernment. So it's not just a matter of knowing the words, but also knowing strategies, how to talk your mind into doing things that you know are skillful, but it really doesn't feel like doing them. Well, you can ask, well, who in there doesn't like doing them? In other words, this is a good place where it's good not to see the mind as a unified or unified entity. Just lots of little conflicting desires in there, and you've got to sort them out. One way of sorting them out is to remind all the desires, hey, we're all here for the sake of happiness. And we want a happiness that really lasts, right? And some will say, I don't care. And then you've got to ask, well, what do you mean you don't care? And you've got to question that voice. You ask yourself, okay, the sufferings that you've had in the past, were you really glad to have them? When they were suffering, when it was really hard, did you not care about them at all? No, you really cared at that point. He says, don't you care for yourself anymore? What is this? Because you find the defilements, even though they have their reasons, have pretty bad reasons. And you can get them out and examine them. You begin to see where the, the reasons fall apart. And they're like people who know that their reasons are bad, so they just get more and more insistent. Just like politicians who've got nothing really good to say. So what they do have to say, they just say it very loudly and very insistently, as if just through force of will there they're going to beat down their opponents. Well, your mind has that kind of politician inside as well. And here's, again, is where you have to be patient and show that you have some stamina. You're not going to give in. But as for which techniques are going to work and which techniques are not going to work, that's up to you. You have to learn to read your own mind. That's a large part of discernment. And when you learn how to read what works and what doesn't work, it may work for a while and come back and, hey, it didn't work this time, they'll go back and look again. Don't get discouraged. We're dealing with complex problems. That's not the case that unskillful actions have only one root. Many times they have many roots, and they spread out in all kinds of directions. But you can take comfort in the fact that when you've pulled out one root, at least you've weakened the, the plant for a while. It puts you in a better position to come back and look at them, those roots again and again and again. As John Munn said in his 
final sermon, the important thing, the most important thing in the practice is to keep that determination up, the determination that you're not going to come back and suffer again. Now that determination, on the one hand, depends on your sense of the possibility. It really is possible to bring the mind to a point where it doesn't have to suffer. And in your own sense that you can do this. That's, realize this is going to be a big job, but as with any big job, you learn how to break it down into small pieces, into manageable pieces, and just work on them one by one by one. Work on what you can manage. And don't hope for the magic bullet that's going to make all the problems go away. If you develop this mature attitude to the practice, just the attitude in and of itself gives you a lot of stamina. It makes it easier to deal with the ups and downs as they come. You don't have to go up with the ups or down with the downs. You learn how to keep the mind on an even keel. Like that story they tell of the, I think it was a Korean monk or a Japanese monk, who's accused of a woman, accused by a woman of having fathered a child. So when the accusations came, she, he said, is that so? Or is that so? That was it. He didn't defend himself, didn't do anything else. And so when she had the child, she came and just put it on his doorstep and said, okay, you've got to raise it. He said, is that so? So he raised it. And then several years he came, she came back and finally said, I'm sorry. It wasn't really your child. I knew all along. He said, is that so? Gave the child back. So you've got to develop that attitude in your mind. Is that so? When things are good, is that so? When things are bad, is that so? That right there helps cut through a lot of problems. So when things go really well, you're not fooled by the reality of what seems to be good. You wonder, well, is it really good? Well, let's watch for a while. And when things get bad, again, is it really bad? Let's watch for a while. That attitude right there doesn't awful lot to carry you through. 